I'd like to start our worship with this song. the sidewalk one day onto the green grass in front of the church, holy ground by most standards, but especially to me. I was standing in the place where I had once heard God calling me into ministry. That ground was so holy I probably should have taken off my shoes to show proper respect, just like Moses was asked to do when God spoke to him through the burning bush. But there was no burning bush, just a pile of ashes where a church had once stood recognizable only by the concrete ramp that led up to where the front door used to be. Ashes to ashes, nothing but ashes. It had all burned down, the church and the whole town around it. A soft drizzle fell on the town of Greenville that day. The rain that everyone had so fervently prayed for during the long, cruel fire season of 2021. Finally, it fell, raindrops mixing with tears as I wept for all that had been lost. A church, a town, a forest, so much loss. Even as I mourned, I knew that there was resurrection and new life ahead. The congregation was already planning to rebuild their church, to stand again as a beacon of hope in the new town that would be built to replace the one that had burned. Even the green grass under my feet, freshly sprouted since the recent fire, reminded me of how quickly new life springs up in the wake of death. Life persists, insists, resists the devastation of even the most ravaging fire. Grasses will regrow and trees and churches and towns. The sacred breath of life returning for the creator of all things is both Alpha and Omega claiming the final word. I knew all of this and still I wept because I felt grief and there is only one cure for grief, grieving. The tears I shed in that ruined holy place were not merely symptoms of grief, but they were medicine. It calls to mind a story from the 11th chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus had been summoned by his friends, Martha and Mary. Their brother Lazarus was sick and on the verge of death. Mary and Martha fervently believed that Jesus could heal their beloved brother, but he was too late. By the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four whole days. He had been placed in the tomb and the ritual of mourning was underway. If we read the whole chapter carefully, we can see that Jesus knew exactly how the story would end. Maybe you do too. Jesus raises Lazarus from the tomb, it's a miracle. And yet even knowing that he was about to restore life and wholeness to his dear friend and lift the impossible burden of grief from the two women who were also his dear friends, do you know what Jesus did? He wept. Listen to how John tells the story and see if you can tell why. Starting with verse 32 of the 11th chapter. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and those who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So they said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Yes, he could have. And of course, we who know the rest of the story know he is about to open Lazarus's eyes from the sleep of death. And still Jesus wept. Why? For what was he weeping? Perhaps he wept to see his friends in pain. Perhaps he wept because he understood that the miracle of resurrection would seal his fate from those who feared him to have become too powerful. They would not let him live once he had demonstrated having that much power. Perhaps he wept knowing that even after his own death and resurrection, people would continue to stubbornly resist the message that he had lived and would die to teach. Was Jesus weeping for Lazarus or for Mary? or for all of humanity. Sometimes tears for one thing, we get tears for other things. Has that happened to you? 
Maybe you've been to a funeral and found yourself weeping for other losses you've experienced. You see the bereaved family members and you recall the passing of your own dear ones. Grief takes you back to memories of other grief and your tears suddenly take on a deeper meaning. You might find yourself crying for all the pain you've ever felt or even for losses you haven't felt yet. A few years after my father's death, I was able to visit the cemetery where we had placed his ashes. So much time had passed because of travel, travel difficulties related to pandemic. I had my moment with my dad, a tearful moment, and then I went next door to the cemetery plot next to our families. It belongs to the Hunter family and we do not know any of them, but my aunt faithfully pulls the creeping Charlie that grows up around the edges of their stones because there is no one left to do it for them. So I knelt beside her to help her clean up those stones and as we pulled the weeds, we uncovered the story revealed by the dates. One mother, five children, had all died between April and May of the same year, 1918, a time of pandemic. I could only imagine the sorrow of that mama who watched one, two, three, and then four of her children sicken and die. The 10 year old, the five year old, the teenager, then the baby. Was that the day her heart broke and she lost hope? And how great was the despair of the last child left to die without even the comforting presence of his mother? The father would go on to live another 20 years or so. What that would have been like for him? I cried for that family of strangers bereaved over a hundred years ago. And then I cried for everyone who has lost loved ones during the pandemic that I had at that point just survived. Parents, children, grandparents, a whole world of grief. Knowing why I cried, I, I think that Jesus' tears were necessary for him. I think even the healer needed to be healed from the deep grief that comes from being human. Maybe even the human incarnation of the divine needed to weep, moved by a love so deep as to feel all the suffering of the world. The only cure for grief is to grieve. Today, All Saints is a day for us to pause between the busyness of the harvest and the preparations for the season ahead. The canning stuff has been put away, but the Christmas stuff hasn't quite yet been taken out. This is our time to pause and take a breath and allow ourselves a moment like we have just seen Jesus take, a moment to grieve, for there is much to lament. Maybe you have lost someone dear to you in the past year or so. That in itself is reason to grieve. And then there's the overwhelming sense of collective loss we feel. Just a few short years ago, we were in the middle of pandemic, which left millions of empty places at family tables. And those of us who survived, we are keenly aware of the continued human losses, if not to illness, then to war or natural disasters. And in this moment of time, some people are losing dear ones, not to death, but to division, as we face perhaps the most contentious election of our lifetimes within days. Underneath all of it is the unavoidable fact that the holy ground upon which we all stand is threatened. Our planet, the earth, is sick and we lament. And yet somehow we manage to balance lament with hope, just as Jesus' grief was made bearable by his awareness that resurrection was imminent. It wasn't the kind of hope that had him singing for joy, not in that moment. Instead, it was the kind of hope that gave him the strength to do everything he could to counter the despair and sorrow of a grieving world. We who follow Jesus must cling all the more tightly to hope in spite of the many reasons for despair. In the face of all that is, hope is a rather audacious thing to have, don't you think? Yet it is the trademark of our faith. Jesus came from a long line of people who could have easily given up on hope many times over. Some did, but they were encouraged by the words of their prophets like Isaiah who promised that even in their brokenness and exile, God would offer them salvation, even swallow up death forever and wipe away the tears from all faces. God's salvation would come several centuries after those writings of Isaiah through Jesus, whose own resurrection would reveal to the world that God would indeed swallow up death forever. And even when we mourn, ours is the God who still wipes away tears from all faces. Let us remember this, even in our moments of lament. The tears will come. They must. That is how we heal. But our God, who chose to be present among us in human form, 
our God who wept with us and for us gives us reason to hope even now that our story is not finished and will not be finished, not even by death. This hope was echoed a bit after Jesus' time by a certain John of Patmos, a bishop from the early Christian church, who wrote words to encourage the faith communities struggling under Roman persecution. Because John's revelation was a heavily symbolic coded message written specifically for the Christians of his time, it is problematic to apply much of this book to any other context. You know it almost didn't make it into the Bible as we know it, but revelation was kept possibly for this one passage which offers us pure and lovely hope. I would share this jewel from Revelation 21.3 in which John describes his vision of God coming to reign. He writes, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God. They will be God's people and God will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. You see, in the midst of darkness and despair, in scorched forests, in the, in the mangled, ashy remains of burned out homes and towns, in every room where people watch and wait and weep, our loving God wipes every tear from our eyes, leading us forward into a time when suffering and death will be no more. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know where, but our faith plants in us seeds of hope that our God is making all things new. Like a soft carpet of green grass which softens the scorched earth, reminding us that God's story is not finished 